Welcome everybody to another fabulous session of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, which is a joint venture between New America, where I work. My name is Lee Grutman. I'm a senior fellow at New America in our political reform program, and the R Street Institute. Uh, you know some folks, Kevin and Casey and Phil. Uh, every month we get together, we talk about all aspects of congressional capacity, and we bring in a speaker to to share some ideas. Uh, this month, our speaker is Julia Azari, who's here all the way from the great city of Milwaukee, home to Marquette University, where she is a professor of political science. You may also know her from her, her copious and insightful writings on Vox, 538, and a few other places. She is a, one of our, our leading political science writers, uh, and is also going to be here in Washington next year at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, so, without further ado, Julia Zari. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm going to do a clicker list. Um, I'm going to talk about weak parties and strong partisanship today. And I'll start out by saying this is a bit of a bait and switch because I'm not talking very much about Congress at all. Um, I'm a parties and presidency scholar, so I'm really talking about a uh, hypothesis that I have for the book I'm going to work on when I'm here next year, um, about really thinking about what parties are and how parties are distinct from partisanship, um, and how those two things are actually working to um, undermine each other. And then I'll talk a little bit about the implications that might have for Congress, and then people who really know things about Congress can tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. Um, but I want to start um, where I think we're all going to start for the next couple decades, which is in the 2016 election, um, and talk about the observation that, that I, I came up with as I was watching things go down in uh, the fall of 2016. So we start with uh, a 2016, 2015 election cycle where Trump has very little <coughs> league support, um, where a number <coughs> of, of important elected officials, organizational leaders, um, and notably, the party's most recent standard bearer, Mitt Romney, as well as a number of people in the conservative media, were all opposed to Trump in, um, in his early candidacy, but were unable to coordinate, um, unable to persuade primary voters to, to choose another nominee. Even as, even as the primary wore on, and we saw a couple points in which party leaders attempted to coordinate, uh, when they did try to send signals that primary voters should gravitate toward Rubio or gravitate toward Cruz, <coughs> those signals were largely, uh, were largely ignored. Um, and they were unable, again, there was a lot of talk about the, ex the potential excitement of a, uh, a broker convention. I know I was excited, um, but then it didn't happen. So I, I think that that really illustrates a uh, kind of party weakness that from there, I've been trying to extrapolate how this might be true in other elements of, um, of party politics. So we start with, with a weak party that can't resist this, uh, this outsider candidate coming in and winning its, winning its primaries and eventually its nomination. But the other side of this, this is a very small graph I'm now realizing, um, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, Trump support among, um, among Republicans. And it starts at 80% and goes up to about 85%. This is from Huffington Pollster. Exit polls suggested closer to 90% of Republicans came home to Trump in 2016. Um, during that period, as we're watching this trajectory happen, um, one of the things that's happening is that elite Republicans who had initially resisted Trump are now um, starting to endorse him. Not all of them, but, but many. Um, and so we see in mass partisanship that that partisan call is still strong, despite the fact that parties are, are weak. Um, and with this observation in the fall of 2016, as I was trying to figure out what was going on, right before the election, um, I wrote a blog post about weak parties and strong partisanship that seems to have resonated with a lot of people, and so now I'm trying to figure out um, whether this is, this is the story all along. Um, so I've got a couple questions here, and I'm not going to answer all of these. I may not answer any of them to your satisfaction. Um, but I want to establish that parties and partisanship are different things. And this might seem, it might seem obvious, but actually in the party literature it's not at all obvious that they are, and people often conflate the two. Um, are they really different things, and what's the relationship between them? And I'm kind of getting to this point of how can we demonstrate this relationship um, is often mutually undermining rather than mutually reinforcing. How did we get here? That's a, that's a long winding story that hopefully um, I will uh, be able to explore more fully when I write the book, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think we got 
to this point where these two things that should be in reinforcing or undermining, uh, what are the implications for contemporary politics? So what, what does this mean right now? What does this mean going into the midterms? What does this mean for the, um, for the relationships among members of Congress and the relationships between Congress and the President? Um, and what is to be done? Um, what, what kinds of solutions are there? So that's a kind of roadmap of what I'm going to try to, um, to cover here. <coughs> Here's a very, very quick slide of a kind of overview of what political scientists think parties are, um, the, the evolution of this history. So we have this kind of classic division of parties. In some ways, I'm kind of going back to that. Um, parties in the electorate, parties as organizations, parties in, in government, um, that these things are distinct and separate. They might have distinct organizational logics. Um, more recently, Political scientists have started thinking about parties either as networks or groups, um, and that the, the real party is is not just the DNC, or the RNC, um, or the formal office holders, but also the media and various related interest groups. That those people are not; those organizations are not competitors to the party, but they are the party. Um, I'm kind of arguing with that definition, um, and then of course there's been a, a wonderful um, new set of literature about parties and group affiliation that, that takes more seriously the idea that parties are one kind of group um, and interest groups are one other kind of kind of actor. Um, what I'm trying to move toward here is a more institutional definition of parties. Um, a, a definition that thinks about parties as mechanisms to undertake the, um, the work of collective action, which includes both winning elections but also governance. Um, so office seeking, but then what do you do once you get office? Um, taking seriously the policy, the policy imperatives that um, that parties and partisans might have, um, and I think one of the things that um, one of the ways, so one of the things I'm building on here is the idea that institutions um, constrain. There's a, there's a set of ideas by uh, Daniel Galvin, another party scholar, essentially argues that we've um, we've been thinking about institutions as constraints too much, but actually one of the ways to think about parties is um, as building up capacity and resources for, um, for actors and institutions can do both. So I'm trying to kind of think of institutions as doing, um, as doing both. Where I really break with, uh, um, with what I'll call the UCLA school of parties, the idea that parties are groups uh, or networks of groups, um, is in a couple ways. One is that we ought to be paying attention to the ways in which those groups figure out whose agenda is going to win, who's in the coalition, who's not, and how they, how they broker within them. Um, I think that that's one of the one of the things that's missing from that approach. Um, but also, that parties are content parties are tending to governance and um, and politics and not just <coughs> policy. That the difference between what they call a policy demander, so an organized interest, whether it's an industrial interest or it's Planned Parenthood, the NRA, um, they're interested in policy. Um, but what parties parties have a kind of responsibility to be interested in governance and the continuation of politics. So those are distinct goals and we ought not to conflate them. So what is partisanship? Here again, this is one of those things where we're like the fish in water. What is partisanship? Um, it's, it's everything that, that's around us, but I'm trying to define it in terms of some ways that we could distinguish it from parties as institutions and organizations. One of those is a social identity affiliation. This is uh, one of the currents among political scientists that's gaining a lot of traction, is the idea that partisanship is really about thinking about who's in your group um, who's not in your group. And this has implications for partisanship as a kind of negative identity, as um, uh, an attitude that you would have where people who, are, who don't share your partisan affiliation are people that are um, illegitimate and <coughs> don't like. Um, I also think a lot about loyalty. I know if um, contemporary political science has good definitions of what, of what loyalty is, but this is another kind of thing that I was hypothesizing about during the 2016 election. Around the time, I think it was right around March, right around Super Tuesday, when um, when it became clear that Trump was likely to be the nominee, um, I wrote a blog post that I kind of thought was a joke at the time. It was sort of like, if Trump becomes a nominee, this will really be a test of, of party loyalty, which is ironic, because this is an anti-party candidacy. And I kind of thought, I, to me, that just felt like a too, like a clever, cute argument I was making that anyone would read. But it turns out that, that I think that question had some traction. Um, but the, the final thing I want to emphasize, in addition to social identity, negativity, and, and loyalty, is ideas. Um, partisanship is also this 
sense of the ideas that hold the party together. And using ideas and ideology as glue to hold a coalition together is distinct from having actual formal or informal rules that hold the coalition together, or having actual organizational structure that, um, that mitigates intra-party conflict and <coughs> gives people something to actually affiliate with. So since, since I've been going on, blathering on the internet about weak parties and strong partisanship, um, one of the things that I, I didn't do in the, the initial theorizing was actually talk about what I meant by weak. It seemed really obvious in the fall of 2016, but it's, it's not obvious. Um, and so I've broken it down into three elements um, of, of party weakness. The first one's capacity. The second one I call control or leverage. Um, the third one is legitimacy. And the literature on parties deals with all of these things in some way or another. So now I'm, I'm just going to kind of draw on what, um, what other people have done. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about capacity. This is actually where parties are pretty strong. Um, this is where I think a lot of the parties literature and this resurgence of parties in the late 90s, early 2000s, mid 2000s um, came from was this idea that you know parties, like there's a book called Back in the Game about party <coughs> capacity, um, particularly around fundraising. And I think that's true. Parties do have substantial capacity. Um, they, have, they have strong brands. They are able to raise a lot of money. Um, they are able to mobilize voters. People to some degree <coughs> disagree about um, how much they're able to do that. Uh, but they don't have exclusive capacity. And I think that's one of the really critical things here as we start thinking about how the different elements of party strength and weakness work together is that parties can do a lot of things, but a lot of different entities can also do those things. Um, and that limits, as we'll see in a second, how much leverage they have. Uh, but I also say capacity is, part of, is compatible with, with partisanship. That's how parties build up partisanship. So those two things are working in concert. It's the leverage and the legitimacy that are throwing a wrench into the works. Um, so here I have another really terrible graph. Um, I promise, after this I only have one more graphic and then the suffering will end. Um, this is just a very kind of illustrative figure, which is uh, the 2016 election cycle, the expenditures, DNC, RNC, and then outside um, in 2016 excluding party committees. So what I want to uh, illustrate there, those are, that's about uh, 300, three, um, 350 million dollars uh, for the DNC and the RNC. That's, it's not um, an in inconsequential amount of money, but there's so many people spending so much money on politics that my kind of read of the campaign finance story is that there's not a lot of leverage coming directly from the parties. And if you were to look at the, um, the congressional election committees, the, the similar numbers to RNC what and BNC. Elections are that? That's 2016. That's 2016. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, that's from uh, Center for Responsive Politics. Um, so the next thing is control and leverage. And here, I think this is once again the kind of hypothesis where this is a, it's an intuitive idea that I don't know we have a lot of uh, systematic work on. Um, the, obvious, the obvious argument here is parties have less control and leverage now that we have primaries. Um, that's, you know, that's pretty clear. The response to that coming in the, um, the early part of the, the 21st century from the, the Cohen et al., the party decides, um, the Bonn et al. UCLA school um, is that, in fact, you know, you do have these networks of people. They do come together and coordinate and endorse, and that does influence nominations. Um, and my hypothesis there is this means capacity with, once again, without control. Um, you have these groups that are, have, they have the impetus to work together. They have incentives to work together. Uh, but that was never likely to be a very strong coalition. They don't have rules, really seemingly um, either strong informal rules or binding formal rules um, to, to actually figure out who, um, who wins in, in, um, in a competitive contest, how they would go about coordinating in a situation where there's you know, 17 potentially viable candidates, um, for example. So they experience coordination challenges because of that, because of that, lack, of, um, that lack of leverage. Here I also think that this explains some of what we've seen in the last in, in this Congress um, in terms of having a strong Republican majority in Congress uh, as well as a Republican president and yet a, a relatively small agenda that's actually come out. Um, in particular, I thought that that was some of what was going on with the ACA repeal was a lack of mechanism to get people on the same page to figure out what that repeal was actually going to look like. So the widespread agreement, we don't like this thing, well, well, what will the alternative be? That's a much more challenging <coughs> question. 
Mm. Here I also want to I want to take a moment to think about um, about asymmetry. So one of the questions I have are the parties are the parties the same in this regard? Um, and here I think that they are a little bit different. So there's research that demonstrates that the Republican Party is really oriented around principles and purity in a way that the Democratic Party is less so. The Democratic Party is more oriented around groups that have specific policy goals. And so that at least gives you a place where you can start bargaining. Um, that their constituents want to see public policy, and so one of the arguments coming out of this, um, this party asymmetry literature is that public policy has a kind of liberal bias, that governance is doing something, um, and conservative perspective is um, about less government doing things. So I think that there is some asymmetry there where Democrats have um, this group-based nature may help them avoid some of this problem in governance, but I also think we'll see. And I'll talk about that when I get to the, the implications for, um, for governance. But I think that you know, one of the things, and obviously the 2016 story is much more of a story of Republican failure to coordinate, uh, whereas Democrats did coordinate on a nominee um, with some, some challenging implications. <coughs> I'll get to when I talk about legitimacy. I'm going to do now. So what you see, again, is I think an undersold element of what party politics actually is. Um, being a partisan is associated with negative qualities. Um, we've kind of known this for, um, for a long time, at least in some segment of the electorate. Parties are often viewed as divisive and useless. This goes back to a long historical tradition, uh, goes back to the founding and fear of parties. Um, but also there's, you know, there's some evidence particularly about why, um, why people don't like Congress that suggests that congressional leaders are are seen as being uh, as being divisive, and that it really comes down to party politics as some of the image problem that Congress has. Some of that research is um, is a little bit older, but that I think is a worthwhile worthwhile hypothesis. Um, and then finally, as we saw in the 2016 <coughs> cycle, partly with Trump's anti-party candidacy, but also on the other side with Sanders' anti-party candidacy, was is that party organizations are seen as corrupt and suspect. Um, so, and there's some. There's some polling evidence to suggest that this has been a lingering factor that's been drawn down um, on, the, on the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has um, <coughs> low, uh, low polling numbers, including among people in groups that we would expect to be more positive. Um, so this legitimacy problem, I think, whoops. Um, legitimacy problem I think is one of the things that's under underpinning the overall relationship across these different um, across these different characteristics is one of the, one of the problems with um, with control and leverage is a lack of having things that other people want, a lack of having rules to make collective decisions. But also when when the membership or the voters don't think that parties are legitimate actors in that regard, it makes it harder for parties to take um, to take control. And so it kind of demonstrated this. The stigma of parties and, poli uh, parties and partisanship. There's this wonderful book called Independent Politics that came out in 2016. It basically makes this argument that independents are undercover partisans. Um, they, have, they have all the same voting behaviors as partisans, but they, when they're exposed to negative messages about partisanship, um, independents are the sort of people who are what psychologists call high self-monitoring. Um, they don't want people to think badly of them, and so when they're exposed to these negative messages, which they often are, then they identify as um, as independents. So I see that as a really strong illustration of this relationship between parties and partisanship, where the ideas behind partisanship organize American politics, mm -hmm. but the um, that the lack of legitimacy of parties makes people pull away from from party politics. Uh, we see the rise of negative partisanship. <coughs> Democratic primary was rigged. Um, so ultimately, this is, I think, a really critical element of the, the relationship. OK, the last chart, I promise. Um, what I wanted to do here was kind of summarize the relationship between um, partisanship and the elements of a party. And to illustrate how some of these things are reinforcing, but some are, are undermining. Um, <laughs> So I think capacity, as I said, can, can actually reinforce, can contribute to partisanship. Um, party building activities, getting people registered to vote, mobilization, messaging. Um, 
and that partisanship in turn can contribute to capacity through contributions, volunteer activity, all the <coughs> typical, um, all the typical political things. And I think again, that's where a lot of the analysis over the last thirty years or so has has stopped. Um, this idea that parties were on the decline in the seventies and eighties, and then now they're now they're back um, because they have capacity and they have partisanship. But I think we're missing a, a lot of the story with that. Um, here, I think, so I think one of the things that happens is strong partisanship undermines leverage with this purity versus compromise dimension. Um, if people in the leadership position <coughs> to, um, to make decisions have to, in order to govern in particular, have to make compromises either within the party or across party lines, um, if they're responding to constituencies that hold purity and partisanship to be important, that have strong negative partisan feelings, that's going to undermine the, the ability of leaders to make, to make decisions and in turn undermine their, their leverage of things that they can actually do. Um, legitimacy, I've already talked about <coughs> undercover partisans and how low party legitimacy undermines um, or is undermined by partisanship. Um, sorry, undermines partisanship. Um, and I also think that this, uh, this kind of what I call a strong partisan state, so a situation where all efforts <coughs> to hold people accountable in particular, elections, impeachments, um, use of, of various um, kinds of, of cross-institutional sanctioning are seen as partisan, it really under, undercuts the whole idea of what party, that parties could be useful. People see parties as just a way of, of infighting, of elites fighting each other, um, trying to undermine each other and get in the way of getting things done. I think that really um, contributes to a kind of cycle of parties being seen as illegitimate. So that's my, my set of hypotheses about what I think is going on in American politics right now and how all these moving parts are, um, are fitting together in ways that often um, cause these different elements to undermine each other. Next we have the question of, all right, how did we, how did we get here? Um, so try to summarize about 100 years of American party history in three lines on this slide. Um, one, again, is that anti-partyism is a really old tradition in American politics. So I think it's, um, it's kind of low-hanging fruit um, to, to argue with party politics in, um, in American politics. That, as I said, it goes back to the founding. There's even an anti-party tradition through the 19th century where parties are um, are quite strong. Um, and then we get reform movements of the progressive era and then more recently in the 1970s um, that both undermine the legitimacy of parties and also undermine the actual capacity of, um, of parties to, to do things. Um, and the last thing that I want to emphasize is this anti-bossism without bosses. So this idea that party bosses are, are illegitimate and, and an important target of reform um, comes out of the progressive era, but I think that a lot of that rhetoric still exists, and that people still think that party party leaders have a lot of control um, and are, are trying to take that control away from rank and file members, um, but without actual party um, actual party bosses. So I think we have a lot of anti-partyism, but relatively weak party sets um, at the top. So this this question this set of explanations has a lot to do with ideas. Um, with the power of ideas about how parties should be run, about who should be in charge, um, to actually be manifested in, in reform. Um, <coughs> the other current that I see that's going on is also, it's about ideas, but it's also about the kind of changing shape of the polity and the changing shape of policy needs is nationalization of the party system. Um, and here, this is, so just to give you a little bit of, um, a background about how this project emerged. This project was originally about nationalization. The argument was parties have been really successful at nationalizing their ideas, so essentially partisanship. Parties have been really successful at having national messages that work in all different parts of the country. Uh, they've been less successful in developing national organizations that are good at, good at coordinating, good at solving intra-party conflict. They've destroyed the, the mechanisms that used to exist and not replaced them with anything at the organizational level. Um, and I identified a couple critical moments for that. These are a couple moments that have become very popular with party politics scholars. Um, one of them is the Republicans in the 70s, and a lot of people have written about the emergence of the, um, the conservative movement as an important force in the Republican Party and manifestation, particularly post-Watergate. Um, post so my next stage in this project is actually to delve into 
more immediately post Watergate element um, and look at the look at the actual party organizational response and look at what the um, what RNC chairs and other formal leaders were um, were doing to try and rebuild the party at that point. But one of the things that I argue is that in a moment <coughs> where the party brand was really suffering, um, you have it's a really good moment for a fundamentally kind of anti-party resurgent movement to to emerge in the um, in the conservative movement, and that the party organizational leaders um, were not either were not able, were not willing, were not interested in rebuilding the party um, organizationally. And then the Democrats in the 50s, which is something no one was writing about 10 years ago, and now is um, everyone's writing about in party politics. This is a really interesting moment because you have the Democrats out of power in the presidency, trying to rebuild, trying to manage their party across. Um, across sectional lines. And what I see there is, I've been through a lot of different archival papers and read the letters that people were writing to, um, to national, specifically national party chairs, um, asking them, among other things, to mitigate intra-party fights going on at the state level. And party chairs kind of resisting that call for more, to have more responsibility. Um, and I think that that contributed to some of the legitimacy challenges that manifested for, for later decades. And so a lot of the stuff that people have attributed to changes in the mcgovern Fraser period in the late 60s and 70s, um, I think actually began in the Democratic Party several decades before, the sort of suspicion of leadership and the lack of willingness of leadership to, um, to do anything. And here I'm gonna really get into some hypotheses, which is about the regional nature of the coalitions. Um, during this period for the Democrats, the two, the two parts of the country that were a pain, that were difficult to, um, were difficult to wrangle, difficult to get on board with the national party agenda, were resistant to national authority in many ways, were the, uh, the South and the West. The South is a story we know. There's deep policy and ideological differences. Um, the West is interesting. There's a sort of strong anti-party tradition um, in, the, in the interior West. Um, and it occurred to me that these two groups were, um, these two groups have, are the ones that moved into the Republican coalition in the 70s, and so I'm kind of looking to think about whether these two groups have continued to be, um, to, to challenge internal party authority for, for the Republicans. So that's my nationalization hypothesis. Um, I've already talked a little bit about the nationalizing glue and how nationalization has been effective for partisanship. So I'll go into my kind of where are we going and what is to be done component here. The main implication that I think is here is that we have, we have an increasing wedge between the politics of elections and then the capacity for, for governance. And that one of the things I see happening is we've got these really competitive elections that don't solve any problems. Um, and that you have, in a partisan environment like this, you should have party responsiveness. And we've got a whole literature about how responsive, responsible parties are not compatible with a Madisonian system. Um, but also I think what, what's going on there is that you don't have enough internal leverage to move forward on a positive agenda, um, to bring people with, um, with similar ideological orientations but not identical policy preferences onto the same page and build enough of a coalition to get something done. And this is where I'm kind of predicting in 2018 the potential for the blue wave and then the governance crash, um, that we have a strong national brand for Democrats to do well in 2018. But then what will that mean when they come to Washington? Um, I think I'm a little more skeptical about getting on the same page for, um, for a governing agenda and what that, what that might mean. Again, there I think that, I think Democrats have somewhat of an advantage over Republicans in that their party is more policy oriented and the groups may be, um, and constituents and constituencies may be more motivated to, um, to engage in compromise because they want to bring home policy. But I also can see, I can see a situation in which the main glue that holds the party together is anti-Trump, and that is a useful agenda for winning an election, not a useful agenda for governing. Um, what is to be done? My first, my first thought is that the options are, are potentially all bad. Um, <laughs> the, I'm assuming in, in this crowd everyone's used to that being <laughs> argument. Um, but one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is should the parties, in particular the Democrats, go back to their decentralized, localized roots? Um, is the answer localized parties? And I think the answer is not without some kind of mechanism like a 19th century style convention where there's broadly accepted rules about how those, 
um, how those different constituent parts come to nomination agreements, and similarly with rules in Congress that would, um, that would facilitate governance. Um, but it occurs to me that, that's, that revitalizing parties at the local level is, um, is important, and revitalizing these mechanisms for collective action is also important, but I don't really know how. Um, one of the things that I think, if I were going to be advising people about what should be the goal of, of political parties thinking about what, what needs to be done, is addressing intra-party conflict and ideologically sorted parties. So historically, democratic parties have not been, um, have not been very well sorted. I've had lots of wildly different ideological constituents. And one of the, the critical developments of this post-1970s world is that that's, not, that's no longer true. Um, where Republicans are mostly unified under a kind of conservative banner, Democrats under a liberal banner. Um, and I think a lot of people have assumed that that means that the days of intra-party conflict that we need to take seriously are over. I think that's not true anymore, or it's, it's probably never been true. It's particularly not true. And thinking about um, how, how to deal with intra-party conflict that's not about, well, how do we bring Southern segregationists you know, into the New Deal coalition or something like that, but it's how do we bring people who are broadly similar together um, and convince them to make the kinds of compromises that they need to make to, um, to govern. But my, la my last possible what is to be done is what I, I hope is the most provocative, which is that our, our parties are, are stale um, and we might need new ones. Not necessarily more than two. I'm assuming Lee is going to argue with me about that. Um, but that we have some of the oldest parties that in advanced industrial democracies, our parties have survived a lot of things you wouldn't expect parties to survive. Um, and neither of, neither of them are really organized around their, um, neither of them are really, are really intended for the purpose that they were designed for, right? They were designed in dr dramatically different circumstances to solve dramatically different problems. And I think you can see constituencies in each party that want it to be something um, something fundamentally different, and that perhaps that would be part of a broader revitalization, at least address the legitimacy problem, and that perhaps the perhaps the legitimacy problems that exist are not are not misguided. And there's an assumption among political scientists, especially, that people who don't like parties are just wrong and ill-informed. Um, so one of the things that I want to take seriously is the possibility that that's not true, that the parties as they currently exist are not serving their partisans. Um, and that that's something to, to think about moving forward. So that's what I got. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take questions. <coughs> All right. Well, well, now we do the, the questions. Uh, Show me my water. <coughs> oh, yes. Uh, so, well, well, we give Julia her water. Uh, Thank you. Who has questions? Um, in the back, and can, can you introduce yourself? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's, that's, that was you, yes. yes. Sorry. Um, I guess I'm you're sort of not, not entirely in the back. But. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Laura Blessing. I'm from the Government Affairs Institute at Georgetown okay. University. Hi again. Um, I really love your presentation. I, I studied Congress a lot, and I keep thinking of how your central kind of paradox applies to Congress. So yeah. it's uh, really interesting. Um, just to be the devil's advocate for yeah. just a minute, you seem to have. Uh, Cast, you seem to be arguing against a group-based definition mm -hmm. of parties. And yeah. I'm wondering, particularly you can't, because you're hanging a lot of this on the 2016 election, yeah. uh, that it's not flawed, but rather that we didn't consider additional parts of the conservative media mm -hmm. as genuine groups, not just Fox News, which eventually comes on board, but initially opposes Trump, but the Breitbarts and the Drudges mm -hmm. of the world who were early and very vocal supporters, and that maybe we right. simply do not have, uh, are not taking these institutions seriously mm -hmm. as members of the party. Um, this is probably something I should find a, someone mm -hmm. who studies media mm -hmm. more and, and write at some point. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. anyway, that's, that's my devil's advocate question for you. Yeah, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna start answering your question by by promoting other work that I'm working on, um, which is um, uh, yeah. Um, I promise I do do things other than self promote, but like not that much. So um, and then I, and then I'm gonna take your question more seriously. So I, I'm actually I, I'm working across UCLA school lines with Seth Maskett on a project on on intra party democracy. Um, we've decided to try to write a book on parties without agreeing on what parties are. Um, <laughs> so far, that's kind of it's going okay. Um, so we've written a little bit about debates, and the debates have this huge media component um, because that's who sponsors them. Um, 
And we've kind of had this argument about, is, is Fox News part of the Republican Party? And what we've kind of found, I wouldn't say this is a definitive answer by any stretch of the imagination, but there's something qualitatively different when the RNC steps in. They have somewhat different goals than Fox News. And so here's where, here, I'm going to answer your question seriously, um, but in a way that is probably like overly honest, like you've seen those overly honest science methods. Um, this is where it would be good if I had a better, better defined dependent variable. This is what, what they mean in graduate school when they tell you to have a dependent variable. Um, it so it kind of depends on what we're trying to explain. Um, and in that sense, I think that I think that the argument that I'm trying to make that, uh, that formal parties and people who are invested in kind of the party as the party as opposed to media outlets that are invested in ratings um, and interest groups that are invested in a particular policy <coughs> area, I think that, that my argument might actually work better for the institution I don't study, Congress, um, than for nominations, which I, I do. Um, you know, I think that that's, like, if, that, if your dependent variable is how effective is this coalition at governing, then Fox News and those groups are going to be often um, a challenge. Um, and whereas if you're looking at, okay, who is the nominating coalition and who's trying to get their candidate through, then you can, you can come up with a story of Trump that makes him look like a party candidate. And I also take seriously, so now I'm going to do the third part, which is I'm going to answer the question I wanted, I wish you'd ask. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, did Trump actually meaningfully co um, what's the word, consolidate the Republican coalition? And I think that's true. I think that there is a, there's a strain of thinking among academics, among, you know, other kind of people with thinking jobs who have college degrees that Trump, some of Trump's earlier messaging about immigration in particular was like, that's not what America is, that's not what the Republican Party is, this is an alien message, and like, I think we have to come to terms with the fact that that's not true and figure out how to talk about it. Um, so I do think that there's, there's a challenge there, and I do think you're right that this is very 2016 derived, and I have to move beyond that to write an <coughs> interesting book. But yeah, thank you for your question. Um, Colleen, yeah. you can introduce yourself to the yeah, group. It's uh, Colleen Choker from the Library of Congress. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my question is about how are you going to approach answering some of these questions because yeah. it seems to me that this is a, a really great um, inquiry, yeah. really perfect for change over time, mm -hmm. um, like as an, as an APD type of project, right. because I guess my, my larger question is, yes, we know parties were strong at a particular era in American right. history, Jacksonian era, you know, all the way up into the 1870s, 1880s when things start to change, right. but then, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, weak parties, when were parties strong, you mm -hmm. know, in, in recent right. history, if you're making that that, right. that that argument, and do you plan on having metrics for each of your three components mm -hmm. of, of party uh, right. capaci capacity or building right. to measure that? So I think that, I think that this is going to be challenging. I've thought a lot about this, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, honestly, in a year after I've had a chance to, to think about this and hang out with all of you here, <laughs> um, I'll have a better answer, but I think that it's there are relatively straightforward ways to kind of triangulate a measure around around legitimacy and around capacity, right? Um, and specifically, I'm interested in relative capacity. So to, to think about, like, how would I measure that? And if you have a bunch of ways of measuring it and they're consistent, then, you know, you have a reasonable argument. I think leverage is the one where that's actually the really important part of the argument, and that's the hardest thing to measure. And so there I have to think very carefully and counterfactually about what are instances of, of time in you know contemporary era, mid-century, 19th century, where parties, party leaders wanted a thing and they had to make someone else do what they wanted to do. It's sort of a first face of power um, kind of approach. What you know, what will be what how can we show that party leaders were able to engender a different outcome than the, the counterfactual we would have observed <coughs> otherwise? Yeah. That's how I'm thinking about it. I don't know. And archival evidence can be helpful for that if it's there. And then if it's not there, then it's not. Um, but that's kind of how I'm thinking about, the, um, about that particular <coughs> challenge. Um, and I want to clarify, and I don't know if this is your question, Richard, but I know you've, you've pressed me about this on Twitter before, <laughs> about whether. Um, whether congressional parties were stronger in the middle of the 20th century, and that is not what I'm arguing. So I'm not arguing parties are weak relative to where they were in the 50s or 60s, or even before that. I'm arguing that partisanship was weak then. So we had a period where partisanship, like the progressives weakened both partisanship and parties. And then partis partisanship resurged, and parties didn't. 
I think that's my that's my hypothesis again. Um, that's my my preliminary argument. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Stasos. I'm an intern at the Cato Institute. Um, and I wanted to ask, does the relationship you outlined for us between partisanship and parties hold at the state level of electoral politics? Because we really only talked about national level yeah. as it does at the federal level. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. I suspect that it, that it largely does. Um, I don't have data on state-to-state -state parties. If anyone has suggestions about that, I'm, I'm all ears um, thinking about that. My sense is that generally there are some robust Republican parties. There are some mostly some weak Democratic parties. And the, there's variation in terms, of the, in terms of control. There's variation in terms of um, how, much, how much state party leaders have control over what happens. Uh, but I think certainly the partisanship angle is, um, is born out of the states. One of the things that's challenging about analyzing this question at the state level is something that Alan Abramowitz has observed, which is that we have a very nationally competitive electoral system and very few competitive states. Um, and I think that probably shapes what partisanship looks like at the state level. So I'm, I'm still figuring out exactly how it's going to fit into this and like how long is this book going to be. Um, but, but I think that's really, I really have to contend with state organizations <coughs> if I'm going to make a, a robust organizational argument. Molly, introduce uh, yourself for the group. Yeah, I'm Molly Reynolds. I'm at Brookings. And I have a question to try and tie some of these themes to some of the things that we talk a lot about in this group. So we care a lot about congressional capacity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have had lots of conversations about is the degree to which in the contemporary Congress, power is uh, centralized in the hands of party leaders, mm -hmm. particularly power over the agenda, which right. sits with the majority party leadership right. in both chambers. So I find um, your argument quite persuasive in the context of sort of electoral politics, mm -hmm. but in terms of bringing it into Congress, yeah. how should we think about, because my reading of kind of congressional parties is that mm -hmm. we have strong partisanship and actually relatively strong mm -hmm. party organization because in large part right. the chambers are organized in a partisan way. Right. And so how does that square with kind of this overall story? Yeah, so this is something where I really need to I really need to read more recent congressional literature, and I've gotten some I mean I've gotten generally positive feedback from congressional scholars about this, so I feel like I'm not totally off base. But my sense is that a lot of agenda control is negative, um, and it's keeping things off the agenda. Um, and so maybe that's maybe that's as strong as parties need to be, but I feel like that's again this goes back to the dependent variable. Um, if what we're trying to explain is, is the capacity to address national problems, then that's, that's not enough. And so substantively, that's, um, that's important. But also, I think the, the thing that's important to me is I think about the evolution of Congress, as I understand it from reading people smarter than me, um, is, um, is the absence of other centers of power, right? Like, a lot of what seems to me what, what looks to people like strong parties is lack of strong anything else. And I think that that plays out in the in the story of Congress with the um, with the decline of committee power. Um, so that that's how I've been thinking about it. I don't know if that gets to all of your questions. Uh, hi, Eric Vandervoort, APSA Congressional Fellow. So I'm going to ask you about the project that you're not writing right now. Sure. Maybe, but I'm thinking about uh, so how when we're treating parties as institutions and in your framework, how they interact with other institutions. So. Mm -hmm. The thing that got me thinking about this is the party boss's comment and mm -hmm. the evolution of New York politics. Because you have a particularly strong governor <coughs> and you have party structures changing over time. So is it that the like you have boss Tammany that declines mm -hmm. over time, the governor eventually becomes kind of boss mm -hmm. Tammany, so that Andrew Cuomo now controls that. Um, so but just how the parties mm -hmm. as institutions when they're changing over time interact with other institutions, mm -hmm. if you have thoughts on that, or is that the next book or um, I'm not sure if that is a. I'm not sure if that is the next book. Well, so sorry. What were the other institutions you're thinking of? Well, I mean, I'm seeing you know the centralization of power in the presidency mm -hmm. as we get the as presidency right. gets stronger and right. the parties are interacting with different institutions from this framework. So, yeah, I mean, my my thoughts about this with the presidency and you know most of my work has been on presidency, so this is actually a jog for me. Um, is that presidents are really well poised to be partisan leaders and not terribly well poised to be party leaders. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's one of the ways that I've thought about this is how different, how different institutional actors are, are poised to, to be able to build up different, different elements. But I've also thought about then in turn how that, what that, what the implications of that are for parties as constrainers of the presidency. Um, but that's still sort of in the, in the nascent stages. 
a better question than I have answered for. Uh, in the back there. Hi, I'm, uh, my name's Tom Dunn. I'm an independent consultant. I just have a question going forward with political parties. Do you think huh? that the there's trouble building consensus or coalitions going forward because so more and more people now, many people are becoming independent. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it seems like if we had a parliamentary system, for instance, the right. caucus would actually be the minority party or the right. junior party of a coalition. And as far as like with Trump, um, I don't think he's so much. He was basically by default. He had the most money. He didn't build a coalition. Almost reminds me, of, to lesser extent, of Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. When he was becoming president, it wasn't because he was a big Republican. Both parties were jockeying for him to be president. He was just, you know, mm -hmm. he, he he would he would deliver the presidency more than anyone else. So it just seems like the parties are in charge by default because we don't have a parliamentary system or just the way our system is set up. Yeah, so I think so there's a lot of questions there. I love the Eisenhower comparison. That always gets my students angry. Um, but, and, and other people, um, the, the personal distinctions between Eisenhower and Trump obviously are, are legion, but I think you're right about some of the appeal. Um, I think that what, what you're speaking to in terms of the independence is a legitimacy element. Uh, but also, I think in terms of the parliamentary question, what we're talking about there is, again, existence of rules, formal or informal. Um, that everybody agrees on, so the legitimacy element um, that exists that can that explain how this partnership is supposed to work. And I think that might be one of the key differences, so I'll give a little nod to Lee's arguments about multi-parties um, here, is that when you have a situation where you have a junior partner in a coalition, then you kind of know what your what your role is. And depending on the rules of the of a given parliamentary system, you have rules about how that how that decision making takes place and who has the most power. When you have huge big tent catch-all parties as we do, those rules are not necessarily codified or widely accepted. And that's where I, that's sort of the, the crux of the, the argument that I'm, that I'm making. So I see the sort of independence element as being, um, as being the, the uh, kind of cornerstone of the legitimacy, um, the legitimacy piece. And I, I really want to go on a tangent about Eisenhower and, and Trump, but I'm not going to. Um, so there's other questions. Phil? Uh, Bill Wall of Art Street Institute. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, is stale parties a competing explanation mm -hmm. relative to weak parties? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess, I guess I, I, I'm inclined to see congressional parties especially as strong but stale, strong mm -hmm. and stale right. at the same time. Right. And so the way they, the way they express that is through negative agenda control because right. if you have this brittle party that, in fact, is quite heterogeneous but wants to focus on just those things that hold it together, mm -hmm. then you can't you can't do too many things. Right. You have to just stay on the core, you know, mm -hmm. your antique core that, that, that right. continues yeah, yeah. to do some work. Um, so I, I guess I guess I would I would I'd just push you to think about to what extent stale parties might be a competing way of thinking mm -hmm. about it versus. Yeah, you know, I, that makes a lot of sense, and I, I don't, um, I, I think maybe you didn't ask a question, so maybe I don't have to answer it. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, no, I think that that's right. So the, the other element of this that I haven't talked about, and I'm not sure I will talk about because I've got a lot of moving parts here, but I think is that one of the critical things, so I wrote a stale parties piece for Politico. I haven't done an academic piece, but I wrote a lengthy Politico piece about it. Um, about the longevity of parties, the missing piece there is flexibility. Um, and so whether flexibility is a strength or a weakness, I think, depends on your, on your perspective. Um, so I think one of the reasons the parties have been able to become so stale is because they have, they have weathered so many distinct crises. Um, so that, that looks like strength, right? Um, but also that flexibility and adaptability, I think, is part of what undermines the leverage. I'm not sure that that's true, but that's sort of my instinct. Um, the staleness, I think, that was a critical part of the of the legitimacy piece, right? That's, I mean, just partly the parties as parties, right? The lack of trust in parties as organization or sense of, of affiliation versus negativity to out partisans, um, I think, is is important. Um, and I don't know. I have to think a little bit about this strong but stale thing. That would be a great book title. Um, <laughs> maybe you should write that book. Um, but uh, the part where you're saying like it's a sort of brittle coalition that hangs on the one thing that they have um, that they have in, in common. The subtext of that I think is hanging on a particular issue or kind of ideological commitment. 
And I'm not sure that that is true. Right, I'm not sure that that describes the, the situation with the parties. I think there's, it's not that they only agree on the one thing that holds them together. They agree on a lot of, of things that don't easily translate into concrete policy items. That would, be, that would be my response to that. And that again goes back to the, um, to the weakness, the lack of a mechanism to bring people to agreement on those, on those mechanisms. But it's not that I see, like you can imagine a party where they only agree on the one issue and then they disagree on everything else. Um, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's the case for either party. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi, my name is Brad. I'm from the Congressional Management Foundation. I'm just wondering, what do you think, um, as far as the capacity for parties to change, mm -hmm. do you think that that's dependent on other outside influences, such as you had the graph up about money and politics, yeah. the Citizens United decision, um, kind of voting patterns, right. gerrymandering? Like, how how do you think all of those outside influences come to play, and whether or not a party can be strong or weak? So I think, again, like one of the things is, is relative capacity. But the other thing, and I may be particularly pessimistic about this, because I live in Wisconsin, which is ground zero of anti-partyism. Right? Like Theodore Roosevelt's blood is still in the walls from <laughs> 1912 <laughs> anti-party run. Right? So when I, come, when I leave Wisconsin and other people are like, no, parties are OK. It blows my mind. Um, but And I, I've got some more questions in the front who can vouch for me here that I'm not making this up. Um, I think that any revitalization of parties is going to depend on people having a sense that that there can be these things that have the goal of winning office and governing and bringing people together in collective action that are good. And I think that the I think the trajectory of public opinion seems to be going the other way, um, delegitimizing many of the many of the mechanisms of, of collective action, um, particularly those that are associated with the left. But I don't see that this is a particularly endemic problem on the left or the right. But we've got you know, a lot of um, criticism of unions, criticism of social movements, criticism of political parties, um, and uh, kind of individualistic political culture coming out, of the, um, coming out of some of the movements in the 70s. So really, I think, I feel a little pessimistic about the immediate future of people thinking that parties are a good thing. And I don't know how we do this if people don't think that parties have a place in governance. So that's a very depressing answer. OK. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Joe. I'm a GW student and another Cato intern. Um, the talk went very interesting. I was wondering if, on this conversation about stale yeah. parties, if you could talk to sort of the importance that um, like historical legitimacy mm -hmm. in parties comes together. I'm thinking about now, in mm -hmm. particular, something that's illuminating in my head is how Democrats have sort of abandoned Jefferson and Jackson. That during FDR's yeah. term, he harkened back to those mm -hmm. two figures as founders of like the Democratic right. Party. Right. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Jefferson and Jackson, of course, take us in wildly different directions as we're thinking about the legitimacy of uh, political parties. Um, so there's a lot there. I'm going to answer the, the part that I think I can answer concisely, um, which is that the, the story, again, that I didn't tell that's link, lurking in all this subtext about inter-party conflict and about inter-party conflict is race. Um, and that's historically, now I'm going to draw my letter. That's historically the, you know, that... I think is part of the part of the impetus for Jacksonian Democrats to create such um, such extensive mechanisms of, of um, collective action and um, ways of solving intra-party conflict is because they have to build a North-South coalition to be competitive, um, and that's sort of the story of the Democratic Party. And I think that feeds into some of the staleness, right? The Democratic Party was built to to be a North-South coalition and to accommodate the South and do whatever else it was trying to do. And that's the story of the Jacksonian Democrats, and that's the story of the FDR Democrats. But I don't think that's the story of the 21st century Democrats. Um, and so I don't know, like, part of your question, I think, is like, who, who is a good icon for, for functional party politics? In the Democratic Party, there's so much racial baggage. Um, that's, that's really hard. And FDR, in some ways, was a party creature, and in some ways, was a, was a progressive anti-party actor. So I think that's... I think that's tricky, um, that and that I'd be thinking a lot about that if I were a democratic strategist, which I'm, which I'm not. I think Richard's been waiting very patiently. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm Richard Skinner. For those of you who don't know, um, there were a number of questions I could be asking that you're probably quite annoying, but everyone else has asked them, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to take you in a somewhat different direction. Okay. Which is we have highly nationalized politics mm -hmm. 
including an increasingly nationalized media, even an internationalized media. I mean, on the internet, nobody knows that you're in Mozambique. Um, but our institutions are still, in many ways, decentralized mm -hmm. and local. Yeah. That people have much stronger bonds these days with either the president or a presidential candidate or some other national leader who could well be a national party leader. Mm -hmm. People clearly feel strong one way or the other about Ryan or Blues, whatever, but have relatively little feeling towards uh, the local officials or mm -hmm. even congressional candidates. Do you see this as an important? Uh, problem in our system that we have nationalized politics but decentralized institutions. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think this is an incredibly um, important mismatch, um, and I really don't know how to resolve it. Um, I, I wish that I wish that I did, and I also think so. Speaking to the question that came from over on this side of the room about state parties, I think that's that's one of the challenges is when. Um, when members of Congress in particular are, are interacting with a localized constituency, they're interacting with a, with a polarized constituency, right? Um, and that's, you know, I think that drives some of what we've seen maybe reaching back to a couple Congresses ago. So yeah, I do see that as, I do see that as a problem. I'm not sure what, like I said, there's one, there's one version where we really turn politics back to being more heavily localized. And I don't know that that's feasible. I think the story of the American polity is a story of nationalization, right? Every, every major watershed problem solution has been a nationalizing one and has been one that has then had nationalizing effects. Um, on politics and on policy. So then, so then the alternative is we sort of delocalize our elections and we have to change the constitution to do that. Um, so I think there, there once again, maybe this speaks to the, to the stale party situation where we need intermediary institutions that, that see that problem as a central problem and are committed to resolving it um, and have a legitimacy to do so. So that's, that's not a very, again, very satisfying policy solution. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really critical central problem. Other questions? Got one more. All right. Yeah, all right. Just a second. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you think that organizational strengths in parties tracks at all the susceptibility to personality politics? Because like lots of examples mm -hmm. are doing either way come to mind. That they don't track, or the well, or the, the causality could be reversed. Yeah, way, one the other. yeah, you know that's a. I don't know the answer to that one either. I tend to be, so I tend to be very suspicious of arguments where the media is the causal factor, um, and I think the media is sort of the the one of the critical stories. And media innovation is a critical story around personality politics. Personality politics is also presidential. I'm assuming you're mostly talking about presidential candidates, right? Um, I tend to think of that as a kind of outgrowth of party weakness and then also a contributor to it. So I think maybe there's a, there's a feedback effect there. Um, but I also think you know, the main thing I'm trying to organize this book around is this idea that in the early 80s and even into the 90s, people thought, okay, parties are just in, on the decline that, and everything is um, the Martin Wattenberg um, thesis about um, the decline of parties and personal politics is going to be people like Reagan and Clinton who are going to govern with their charisma. Um, and what we saw almost immediately following that is people who govern with their charisma in a way that's distinctly partisan. So George W. Bush d governs in a way that's, I think you could argue, you know, has a lot to do with his biography and personality, but that maps onto partisan commitments. And then Obama and then Trump. Um, so I think what's happened is those two things have become aligned. Um, but it's partisan and it is still antithetical to party building. So that's the, I think that's how it goes, <coughs> how it's gone. All right, well, if there's no more questions, then I'll, I'll just ask, ask my question. Why, why, why two parties? I, I mean, I mean, electoral institutions aside, but why, right. why, do, we, why do you, you know, assuming we could change the first past the post system. I just, I don't think it matters that much one way or the other. I've been hanging out with a lot of comparativists lately, um, and it's not clear to me that what that um, multi-party systems address the problems that we need them to address. Like I think that it, as long as you have clear rules, it doesn't really matter what those rules are as far as this kind of representational structure. And I think that multi-party systems are m more susceptible to extremism than ours. 
which I know is one of the things that that we have both written about on the internet. Richard has written about on the internet, um, trying to trying to alleviate. You know, if you look at if you look at countries that have five or six parties, they are not centrist systems. Well, we could debate that, but. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> But I mean, right? They're producing stronger extremist movements. But I don't. But, have but, but the governing coalition is more centrist. It's consistently more centrist. In Denmark and the Netherlands and places like that. The over historically over over a large swath mm -hmm. of many years, on average, multi-party systems produce more centrist policies. Than the U.S. or then. Well, then then majoritarian systems. And the U.S. is is not quite a majoritarian system because we right. have this weird Madisonian. Jerry rig system right, right, fair. To, okay. to, to prevent us from being majoritarian. Right. No, that's fair. I mean, and then, and then we have this yeah. this confusion, which you mentioned, is that we have majoritarian political culture on a anti-majoritarian political mm -hmm. system, which means everybody's disappointed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's another good book title. So, uh, okay. So to answer your question, Lee, I don't have any particular attachment to two parties. I just don't think that multiple parties are going to address enough of the problems that I see to be to be worth blowing up the electoral system in ways that I don't see as being possible. That's the... Fair enough. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't... I mean, so if, if there were a movement for multiple parties and they had, a, they had a good strategy to win, then that would be fine. I just... I don't see that happening and it just seem, it seems like too much work for too little payoff. Fair enough. Right? Well, I think... We'll call it a day. Uh, so thanks to Julia for stimulating. Thank you.